significance does using the word confidential? Oh, that's that. easy. Um, generally speaking, it reminds me of what I've come to call the Diddley principle. It don't mean Diddley. Um, yeah, confidential. Um, you mean your stamp is confidential? No, I've heard Doesn't mean a thing. emails that say confidential and you sort of... Oh, we get them all the time. You get an email from a law firm and it says, this is privileged and confidential. I'm not the client. It doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean a thing. Let's talk about the word confidential. And I have to admit to you that there are differences of opinion regarding its meaning. But, but, um, to my mind, confidential refers to those matters which cannot be disclosed based upon statutory guidance provided either by the state legislature or by Congress. Our first exception in FOIL deals with records that are specifically exempted from disclosure by state or federal statute. A statute, again, is either an act of Congress or an act of the state legislature. And there are numerous statutes that confer confidentiality. Usually they deal with intimate details of people's lives. Um, if you are poor and you apply for or receive public assistance, the records maintained by the Department of Social Services identifiable to that person are confidential. It's nobody's business to know that so-and-so is poor. Your medical records, everybody knows medical and mental health records are confidential with respect to the public. They cannot be disclosed. There are numerous examples of statutes that confer confidentiality. On the other hand, standing at confidential, agreeing to confidentiality, those kinds of activities just don't mean a thing. Um, there have been many situations in which there have been controversies where some sort of a settlement agreement is reached. And what if one of the terms of the settlement agreement is, the terms of the settlement agreement shall remain confidential? The courts have said, you can't do that, you cannot create confidentiality, where it does not exist by virtue of a statute. By virtue of a statute. To be distinguished are situations in which there is the option to withhold. The option. And that's what most of the freedom of information law is about. It says that an agency may withhold records in certain circumstances. It doesn't say that an agency must withhold records. The only situation in which an agency must, again, is when a statute says that the agency must maintain confidentiality. You with me? Yeah. Okay. Um, any, anybody here have issues involving a school board, school district? Is that a yes? You know, I'll be, I'll be completely honest with you. you know, and the open meetings law says the same thing. Remember I said earlier that a board may enter into an executive session to discuss certain things? If the motion to go into an executive session doesn't carry, the board is free to discuss the issue in public, which tells us that the subject is not inherently confidential, right? If you have the option, it's not confidential. And in fact, there are federal cases that deal with this ability, if you will, to disclose as opposed to the option to withhold, the ability to disclose when there is an option. And the federal courts have pretty much said that the item is not confidential, again, unless a statute forbids disclosure. And this comes up in the context of school board business uh, in conjunction with issues involving kids. Anybody here ever hear the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act? Yeah, one, two, FERPA is what it's called. It applies to every educational institution in the country that participates in a federal funding or loan program. So it covers every public college and university, school district in the, in the country, as well as numerous private colleges and universities. It cuts in two directions. It gives parents of minor students rights of access to the records about their kids. The kids acquire the rights of their parents when they reach the age of majority. Concurrently, it forbids disclosure to third parties unless either the parents or the students reaching the age of majority consent, as the case may be. That is a situation where a board member would be prohibited from disclosing information identifiable to a student unless the parent consents to disclosure. On the other hand, if the board wants to discuss the superintendent and how well or poorly he or she is doing the job, certainly they may go into an executive session. But they don't have to. They don't have to. 
to my mind, that tells us that there is nothing contrary to law if so-and-so discloses what transpired during the executive session. Whether it's good or wise or ethical to do so, to my mind, is separate and distinct from whether it is illegal to do so. The Open Meetings Law applies to so-called public bodies. A public body is an entity consisting of two or more members, typically either elected or appointed in accordance with some provision of law to carry out some sort of governmental function collectively as a body, like the Board of Trustees, the Town Board, the Board of Education, Planning Board, Zoning Board of Appeals, City Council, County Legislature, Senate, Assembly, those are typical public bodies. Yes? So a public meeting or a meeting... I'm getting it. <laughs> you said two or more. Yes, so an entity consisting of two or more. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> the next, the next question, of course, is here, is the here. next question, of course, is what is a meeting of a public body? And there's a history. There's a history. The Open Meetings Law went into effect in 1977. The term meeting then was defined a little bit differently from as it is defined now and has been for 30 odd years. At the time, a meeting was defined to mean the formal convening of a public body for the purpose of officially transacting public business. Well, all over the state, various kinds of boards, commissions, whatever, said, well, we're, we're not going to transact public business. We're just going to talk. We're not going to vote. We won't take action. This isn't a meeting. It's a, it's a workshop. It's a work session. It's a study session. It's everything but a meeting. Well, we offered our point of view, and of course, Many disagreed. Um, the city of Newburgh became the subject of a lawsuit which went all the way to the state's highest court, the Court of Appeals, and it dealt with so-called work sessions held solely for the purpose of discussion by the city council of Newburgh. And the Court of Appeals said very simply that any time a majority, a quorum of a public body, gathers for the purpose of conducting public business, and that is the term that has long now been used in the law, that is a meeting subject to the Open Meetings Law, irrespective of the intent to take action, regardless of what it's called. So, the bottom line is fairly simple. Anytime we have a gathering of a majority of a public body for the purpose of conducting public business, yes, that's a meeting subject to the Open Meetings Law. Now, for what it's worth, sometimes in a gathering like this, Somebody will raise a hand and say, you know, I'm on the board of trustees of the village of whatever, um, and there are two other members here. We're three out of five. Are we in violation of the open meetings law? Well, the answer clearly is no. Nobody would walk in here and say, hmm, looks like, smells like, tastes like a meeting of the board of trustees. The three would simply be individuals within a larger audience. They would not have gathered for the purpose of conducting public business as a body, the open meetings law wouldn't apply. But again, the thrust of the law is clear. If a majority gets together to talk about whatever the business of the body might be, that triggers the application of the open meetings law. Every meeting must be preceded by notice. If a meeting is scheduled at least a week in advance, the law says that the notice has to be given not less than 72 hours prior to the meeting. If it's scheduled less than a week in advance, the law says that notice has to be given quote, to the extent practicable at a reasonable time prior to the meeting. That means we do what's reasonable under the circumstances. In terms of the nature of the notice, the law says that notice must be, number one, given to the news media. What the news media chooses to do with it is up to them. Number two, it must be posted in one or more designated conspicuous public locations. And number three, now, based upon a relatively recent change in the law, if a public body has a website and it has the ability to post, it is required to post the notice online as well. So you have a, essentially a threefold notice requirement today, 2011. In terms of the issue that you raised, we look at the law and it tells us that an executive session is a portion of an open meeting during which the public may be excluded. It's not separate and distinct from a meeting, it's a part of a meeting. And technically, a board, a public body, cannot schedule 
an executive session in advance. It may predict an executive session, but it cannot schedule an executive session. Why? Because in order to go into an executive session, a simple procedure has to be accomplished in public. It involves three elements. Number one, somebody on the board has to introduce a motion in public. Number two, the motion has to indicate what they want to talk about. It. And we'll get into that in more detail in just a moment. And number three, the motion has to be carried by a majority vote of the total membership, notwithstanding absences or vacancies. So the key really is that we don't know necessarily with certainty in advance whether a motion for entry into executive session will indeed be carried. And again, for that reason, we have advised the courts have agreed that technically we cannot schedule an executive session in advance. From there, and this is why I suggest that you bring your handout with you to every meeting, page 14, you have the eight grounds for entry into executive session. And are you okay? You want, you want some water? No. Okay. Sweet. Sweet. Um, we're old friends. Um, I have suggested, I have suggested um, the applicability of what I've come to call the Tracy Chapman principle of law. Anybody know Tracy Chapman? I know. Who's yeah. Tracy Chapman? Yeah. So what's the Tracy Chapman principle? Best song of the 90s. Don't tell me fast cars. <laughs> Baby, just give me one reason and I'll turn right back around. You look at the eight grounds for entry into executive session and the question is, does the subject matter fit within any of those eight grounds? If it does, so be it. If it doesn't, presumably the meeting has to be held open to the public. Now, in conjunction with the issue that you raised, what do you think? Do any of the grounds apply? You know, we, hear the, we hear the phrase contractual negotiations all the time. The only place in the open meetings law where you see anything that relates specifically to contract negotiations deals with collective bargaining negotiations involving a public employee union. Clearly, the subject matter that you described has nothing to do with collective bargaining. But let me ask you this. Many of you have gone to meetings What's the favorite word for going into executive session? Contract negotiation. No, not that's not. Litigation. No, that's not. Litigation, were you from Suffolk County? <laughs> no, it's the land of hostility, that's why I asked. Confidentiality. Confidentiality? Personnel. 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 Who said personnel? personnel. That's right. Judy Myers. Judy Myers, personnel, personnel. I hear it all the time. And yet, I suggest just as often that the word personnel should be stricken from your vocabularies. Why? You can read the eight grounds from exec for executive session from beginning to end. You won't see the word personnel there at all. Huh. Huh. And there are some personnel related issues that unquestionably may be discussed in executive session. There are others that simply cannot. And as we look at the language of the exception, it may have nothing to do with personnel at all, but rather completely different kinds of issues. And that's where we get into your question, I suppose. But um, personnel, what does it mean? It means a thousand things to a thousand people. Throw it away. It's garbage. It's garbage. It's a catch-all. It's a catch-all. And um, you're reminding me, too, I wrote an article a while ago regarding what I've come to call myths. Have you heard this one? We can't talk about it. We can't disclose anything. It's a personnel matter. The law doesn't say that. The law doesn't say that. But we in this country, Americans, in too many instances, have become stupid and sheep-like. And we hear these things over and over and over again, and we begin to believe that they're true. Well, when that happens, we begin to lose our rights. And it's my job, at least in my opinion, in old age, to attempt to explode those kinds of myths. Think about this. It comes up all the time. School board, school board talking about the budget, says to itself, huh, can we really afford, do we really need this art teacher position in the elementary school? Well, what, what if there's only one elementary school and one art teacher? Everybody's going to know whose position it is, right? What do you think? Executive session? No. 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 Why? Because the issues involve policy. How do we, as the governing body of this large public corporation, 
determined to allocate public monies. Is art really important to the education of our kids? Yes, it's a personnel matter, but it does not fall within the scope of the exception. On the other hand, if the question is, does this art teacher deserve tenure? Should we keep him or her, or can him or her? There, the focus, in the words of the law, is on a particular person. And as we look at the language of the exception, it is precise. I'll quote it to you. It says that a board can close the doors to discuss the medical, financial, credit, or employment history of a particular person or corporation, or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person or corporation. So to qualify for consideration in executive session, the issue must focus on a particular person or corporate entity in conjunction with one or more of those qualifiers. Yeah? Do they have to disclose the name of the person? Or the no, no, no. But let me get to that. Um, if the board introduces a motion and says, we want to discuss a personnel matter, do you have a clue whether they're complying with the open meetings law? Not at all. Not at all. What we have advised, what the appellate division agreed, is that the motion under that provision should include two components. Number one, reference to that key word, particular, so that we know that the focus is on somebody or some corporate entity. And number two, reference to one of those qualifiers. I move to enter into executive session to discuss the employment history of a particular person, or something like that. Um, the board would not have to identify the individual, but if the board tells us that much, what it's really saying is, yep, we've read the open meetings law, and unless we're fibbing, we're about to discuss a subject that may properly be considered during an executive session. Okay. Um, uh, elected official will say, I can't talk about it because we talked about it in executive session. Yes. Well, I was sort of getting to that in relation to the school board thing. Uh, and you hear it, you hear it from school boards. You remember I said a little while ago that in my view, um, information, if you will, is not confidential unless there is a statute that forbids disclosure. Um, so the question has been, can a school board member or others on other boards divulge what transpired during an executive session? And I wrote opinions years ago um, in fact, they're so old, I actually went to the library. I couldn't go online. And again, I found federal and state decisions indicating that to prohibit disclosure by a public official, um, there must be a statute that forbids disclosure. Um, and consequently, it's been advised that a school board member may, may, without breaking any law, usually divulge what occurs during an executive session. And in fact, there is a judicial decision that dealt with the issue in relation to litigation. And the argument was made that disclosure of information acquired during an executive session would somehow be illegal. And the court said, no, there's nothing in the open meetings law or any other statute that specifies that what is said or heard during an executive session cannot be disclosed and is indeed confidential. Um, again, I relied upon both state and federal judicial decisions. On the other hand, the Commissioner of Education wrote a decision um, that says, in essence, that if a school board member divulges what transpires during an executive session, that person can be kicked out of office. Um, my belief is that the Commissioner of Education, and it's a different commissioner now, was, what's the word I'm looking for? Wrong. <laughs> it was just plain wrong. And I'm waiting for a situation in which a school board member is booted off the board, sues for a billion dollars under the U.S. Civil Rights Act, and wins. Um, not only that, when I started saying to people who raised the question that I thought the commissioner was wrong, State Ed actually called me and asked me to stop saying that. <laughs> That's when I started yelling at the board. Uh, so in any case, there, as I said, there are differences of opinion. Um, God knows, you know this as a member of the news media, one of the rules of human nature is that there's somebody on every board who's willing to spill his or her guts after <laughs> God knows if that were a crime, if that were a crime, there would be a lot of city council members, town board members, village board members, school board members in jail, but they're not, at least not for that. At least not for that. Um, I think I think that that um, the commissioner was I, I hesitate to say it, 
pandering to his constituency. And, you know, it's very interesting, and I'm telling you more than I should, but I'm asked to speak before all kinds of groups, including um, programs for new school board members. And um, the first speaker is always from the State School Boards Association, who gets up and says, you know, we really, really want to appear to be unified and unanimous, and gee, we don't want to disagree in public, and you shouldn't, you know, and there are boards that have passed rules that say, only the president of the board can speak to the news media. And board members have called and they said, do I have to buy, abide by this rule? And I, I have said, I think you should violate it with impunity. Um, <laughs> why? We have this First Amendment thing in this country. I can read the back of your t-shirt, you know, to, to remind people what it is. But um, I'm not suggesting that a board member get up and say, I am representing the board. But certainly, a board member, in my opinion, has the obligation to express himself or herself regarding an issue of public interest. How do we know who to vote for the next time around? And I've suggested to board members that it's their job to disagree. It's their job to disagree. Why do we have city councils, town boards, village boards, school boards? Presumably the idea isn't to bring people together, all of whom agree. The whole idea is to bring together people who have different points of view. And the idea from there, at least as I understand it, is that through the process of discussion, deliberation, compromise, something